Oh my gosh. Did I do it finally? <laughs> oh my gosh. It took me a hot minute to get this done. Apparently I had scheduled this live on my mobile, my mobile, my phone. And because I scheduled it on my phone, it wouldn't let me switch to my webcam. So I don't know what is happening. Um, but we're good. We're good to go. Okay. We're on. Awesome. Okay. I'm also going to actually go live on Instagram because why not? Right. So, um, I wasn't originally, which is why I was going to go on my desktop and not my webcam, but whatever. Okay. Anyway. So, Hey everyone, welcome to design create inspire today. We are talking about architecture business. We're going to talk about AREs. We're going to talk about um, recommended tips for when you're first starting your business. Um, I put out on Instagram a uh, like Q and A box, and I got a, a kind of a wide range of questions, going from business to exams to parenting while taking your exams and business and all that stuff. So we're going to kind of go through a couple different areas. And hello, if you're on here today, welcome. Happy Tuesday morning. If you have any questions, since you're here with me live, throw them in the chat. Let's talk about it. Um, love to go over anything. So every Tuesday, I have a episode that comes out on YouTube on Design, Create, Inspire. I say Design, Create, Inspire, but my channel's called Be Young Design, so I guess that can be confusing. But comes out every Tuesday. I decided this week just to do it live because that's fun and I like engaging and seeing what your questions are rather than just me, you know, coming up with my own random questions or topics. So I wanted to engage you all more. And so that's what we're doing here. So, hey, Scott, how you doing? I know it has been a minute. How you doing? Oops. Okay, so I'm on my computer streaming to YouTube and I'm on my phone streaming to Instagram. This is my first time doing it. So that's also why I'm 15 minutes late. <laughs> Bear with me. I am a tech person, but you know, trial and error. So let's just get into it. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. I'm pretty sure on, oops, sorry. I'm pretty sure on Instagram, there might be like a little button that you can press that where you can ask questions, but just throw them in the chat too. That works as well. Um, and I'll just start going through some of the questions that I was, um, that I was originally asked. Scott, was it your, your signal or mine? Hopefully not mine. I was just saying, hi, it's been a minute. Good to see you. I'm back. Are you back? I hope. Okay. So, uh oh, of course. Sorry, now my mom's calling me. <laughs> I forgot to put do not disturb. It's just, you know, it's like that day where it's like, I'm going to go live. And then all of a sudden, everything happens, right? Okay. Hey, John, Ed, is it Johnny? Nice to meet you. Cool. I'm loving some questions coming in. Um, since you guys are live with me, I will answer your questions and then we'll dive into some of mine. So, um, oh, shit. Yeah, sorry, I froze. I got a call come in. So hopefully we're good now. I put it on do not disturb. Hopefully that's the last time it'll happen. Um, so Johnny's wondering what software do I use for my practice and why not ArchiCAD if so? So we use Revit, so we don't use ArchiCAD. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who are possibly shifting to ArchiCAD and from my experience, from what I've heard, and obviously, you know, I only hear as much as I, as much as I am, no. Um, what I've heard is that a lot of people, or what it seems to be, a lot of people that are moving to ArchiCAD are people who didn't jump into Revit and who are going from, from um, AutoCAD into BIM. And so instead of jumping from AutoCAD to Revit, they're going into ArchiCAD. Now, I don't know if that's everyone's experience, if you work in ArcCAD, I'd love to hear what your experience is with that. Um, I started working in Revit in 2013, uh, probably actually at the end of 2012. And 
Um, it was very new. It wasn't being taught in the school, but I had heard about it. It seemed like it was much more efficient than going from SketchUp to AutoCAD and losing information between the two. It just didn't seem like it was conducive for optimal pr production and flow. So I started teaching myself Revit 2012, um, started using it for actual work in 2013. And uh, so that it's been about 10 years. So I love Revit. It's it works really well for me. I know that there are certain people who um, believe that it doesn't create a lot of creativity because it's constricted. Like you're not working with like free flowing lines. You're working with forms like a wall system. But in my opinion, you can be even more creative because you're not having to um, and more precise because you're not having to redraw every line. Like in AutoCAD, if you have a wall system, you're drawing those lines to create those things, the different systems. With AutoCAD, I mean with Revit, you build a, a wall. So you can have five different wall types in a system that you build and then you can switch them all really quickly and efficiently. You can also switch really quickly from a section to a um, floor plan. And then if you, if you change something, it's reflected elsewhere. So there's less room for user error. Now that may be the same for ARCHICAD. I do hear that people like ARCHICAD. I can't really speak to it because I don't have experience, but if anyone is, I'd love to, I'd love to hear. So, um, oh, I see you said you have parallels. Let me see real quick. I'm going to scroll up for a minute. Um, you looked into ve Vectorworks 2 with Soul Practice a couple years ago. Yeah, I had heard about Vectorworks 2. Um, main reason for being dissatisfied with Revit was because it has no Mac OS native application like AutoCAD. Yeah, so and so you have to use Parallels. That's what I had to do for years, uh, especially because I, I have a PC um, at home, like my, my desktop, but I have a Mac computer. And I almost bought a PC computer. And I'm like, I just can't do it. I just can't do a PC computer, um, a laptop. So I still have my Mac. I, when I work on Revit, I work on my desktop, not ideal if you're, you know, switching around, but, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that we Adobe software works really well on Mac, which is great for architecture. And then we, a lot of the software, like the building software works best on PC. It's like, can't we just figure out something? So, um, um, less, sorry, I don't know your name based on your thing, but less masterpiece limited says, I find that most architects use AutoCAD, but not the architectural one though. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, I, I can't with AutoCAD. Like when I see, I mean, for sure there's an efficient way to use AutoCAD when you really get it. And I remember like back in the day, late, oh gosh, like aging myself, 2008, 2009, I was proficient at AutoCAD and, you know, you could work around it, but like, my God, you, you, you forget to update like a section or something because you updated it here. Like you, you changed something in a floor plan. So now you have to change it in six different other areas. Like, and then also we're such visual people. So be able to like move around it and go through a 3d space, walk through it, you can't do that in AutoCAD. So what do we do? We build it in SketchUp. And now we're going not only from different models, but now different softwares to different. It's just like there's so much more room for error that I feel like it's a bigger liability to be using multiple softwares and um, multiple views like that. So that's how I approach my software. Um, even now we use Enscape in my practice. And so we go from... Uh, we we we're all, we're pretty much all only working in Revit. Then we do have a view in Enscape where we can walk through in real time with the client. But what's epic about that is now we can be in Revit, and the client says, um, "You know, what if we bump out this wall three feet? What will that look like?" And so we can literally do that in Revit, and in real time, that's sending it over to Enscape. And we're visually seeing it. And then the owner says, uh, never mind, let's switch back. And so it's like a five second 
decision that we can make that can save so much time. We can see it in real life or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of benefits. Now, Revit and Enscape are definitely some of the more expensive ones, but it it depends. If you're running your sole practice, okay, well, you can charge more because you have these software. At least that's how it's been my thing. When I've had pushback on some of my proposals, I've said about fees, I said, well, you know, because we use this type of software, we're able to show you renderings in real time walkthroughs uh, really efficiently without extra cost. And, you know, so we're able to provide a service that in the end could reduce costs or reduce changes in the field. So that's kind of how I go about it and, and what works really well for us. So um, if you're on YouTube, hello, welcome. Um, I'm on Instagram too, so I'm kind of like dual chatting. But if you have any any questions, I'm just doing like open Q&A today. I have some, I'm going to definitely talk about business. I know there's been a couple questions about um, like fees and how when you're starting a business, how to go about fees and, and whatnot. So I definitely want to dive into that. And then also some of the architecture exams and parenting. Got a couple questions with that too. So um, AutoCAD architecture is similar to Revit. Oh, interesting. Is it like a BIM software? I'm not so familiar. Um, yeah, Scott is saying that that's why he... Oh, uh, was staying with Revit. Um, BIM th I did have BIM 360, but I, I don't, I haven't found that there's been a lot of, cl uh, uh, consultants that are also using Revit. So I've had consultants saying that they are, uh, wanting to get in Revit, but it's just not formulated with that, like collaboration quite yet, which is a bummer. So we have submitted, um, like the Revit viewers for a lot of like usually our structural engineers and so that they can look at the Revit viewer and analyze the design from a full on walkthrough perspective and not just a 2D, which is really helpful too. So um, we have used that. All right. Alexandra, hi, how are you? When you started out, did you use the AIA contracts or did you create your own? Great question. I love this question because when you're going through the exams, it's like you better know those contracts like front and back. But I will tell you that I do not use the AIA contracts in my business and I did not use them when I was first starting out either. Now, I... I may have I may have done it differently if I had just started out on my own without a lot of experience and um, knowledge of what the contracts were in the firm I was working in because the AIA contracts set you up for safety. They're really there to protect you as the architect. They're like I mean even so much as like it, it takes responsibility off you and puts it on like the contractor. And so they are really set up. They're also very long. They're very detailed. They can be intimidating to anyone you're working with that's going to be signing it. So it could be intimidating to a client to receive a, you know, whatever 15 page contract. And before I started my own business, I was working for a contractor and one time we were working with a younger architect who um, had just started his practice within a few years and he gave us an AIA contract to review. And the owner that I was working for was reviewing it and was like crossing everything out and just hating on the AIA contract. Like just saying like, nobody uses this. He's such a rookie because he's submitting an AIA contract. And so it was just, an experience that I kind of paid attention to. Um, again, 
I was working at that time for a contractor, not an architect. So it does make sense why the contractor was not too happy, not too keen on the AIA contract because it was providing a lot of that um, responsibility away from the architect and onto the contractor. So as an architect, that is great. However, I have found that these um, longer complex contracts are not totally necessary and can create issues. It depends on the typology you're working on. It depends on who you're working with. Are you working with, you know, a state run um, project? Are you working on a small residential project? So when I first started out, I was working on small custom residential projects where it made sense to have a smaller contract. So I have now since developed that. It's been a 10, almost 10 years of slowly developing it, going through a lawsuit and developing it further after that lawsuit. Um, and I will tell you, I didn't have the AIA contract when I was sued. And that's a whole other topic I'm more than happy to talk about sometime um, because it's a great learning lesson. And I will tell you just segue real quick is that the best learning lesson I ever had was going through a lawsuit when I was early in my career. And I wouldn't change it for the world, but my God, it's very tough to go through when you're going through it. But I didn't have the AI contract when I was, when that happened, but I did have a fairly solid contract at that point and it did protect me a lot. And I also had professional liability insurance, so it wasn't as detrimental as it could have been. So um, get yourself professional liability insurance when you're first starting out, no matter what, even if you're just working for a family friend, because you never know what's going to happen once you start mixing business and and um, family or friends. So professional liability insurance and a good contract. So um, I do have a contract that I offer on my website, which is dci.beyoungdesign.com. So if you want to go on there, I have a template that you can download. This is the one that I used back in the day. Plus it's been developed over now. So, um, it, it is important to have a good contract. It's important to have one that has been reviewed, um, and includes the important things. And if you are starting out, I think having a smaller digestible uh, contract is um, really important for getting the project because it feels a little bit more approachable, if that makes sense. So good question. Um, some stuff came in up top here. I want to just dive into, um, whoops, Scott. Um, yeah, Scott says he doesn't use the AIA contracts unless it's required by the project owner. So that's a great point. Like if it's required by the, the owner or the client, like if it's, um, some are required if like it's a state or government or, um, whatever, some might require it. So that's always something to consider. And having such a firm understanding of those contracts is important because a lot of what my contract is, is a form of that, just a little bit of a, um, it doesn't have some of the, the parameters that aren't really necessary. And then also in some of them, it kind of just rewords it in a way that is a little bit more understandable. So understanding the contracts is so important. So Scott says that he developed a contract based on materials and resources purchased from Eric uh, Eric Reinhold, I love Eric at 30 by 40 and Mark LePage at Entree Architect, my two favorite people. <laughs> um, I don't have Mark's contract. I did get Eric's contract like way back in the day. I think when he very first came out with it. So it was probably like 2013. And um, but I do I have in my notes, I was going to recommend some books to someone who asked and Eric's book is one that I recommend. He's great. And Entree Architect is so great for just getting started on your business. They have a great, uh, awesome Facebook group. 
I've been a part of that group forever and it's really great for like questions and you know when you're talking to other entrepreneur architects from all over the country there's a lot of different um opinions and information so it's really really helpful but it can also get a little uh a little tumultuous over there as well but it is really good i love it oops okay oh yep see scott said not in a lawsuit yet but but am currently in the middle of dealing with a former unhappy client who wants to take me to mediation yeah so i have um I have been told that it's not if you'll get sued, it's when as an architect. And it makes sense. Like we're dealing with all sorts of people, um, client, contractor, uh, consultants, all sorts of things with building and stuff can go wrong and, and building is not cheap. So when you're de dealing with that, um, something might come up where the owner's like, I don't want to pay that. That's not my fault. I'm not going to pay that extra money for whatever issue it is. And then the contractor's like, oh, well, it's not my fault. I'm going to, you know, we always want to play the hot potato game. And so it is something that you, if you decide to go off on your own and start a business, you might, you most likely encounter it. And it's okay. And it's not the end of the world. If, and when it happens, you'll get through it. Um, it doesn't feel good. I had a lot of sleepless nights that, that time. Um, but protect yourself. That's all you can do. You can be honest. What do you call it? Uh, take the higher road, be kind, have insurance and have a good contract. Those are my tips. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, should we segue a little bit? Um, I do have a couple more business ones, but let's segue here. Hi, Derek, how you doing? Derek's asking, how much time to prepare for the first ARE exam, practice management, putting into perspective, you're also working full-time as of today, when would you schedule? Great question. So Derek, where are you at in the process? Have you done anything? Have you gathered your resources? Have you, um, where are you at? Because that's important. And while you're taking time to answer that, um, I will say having a full-time job, having kids, having a life are all things that are so normal when you're first starting your exams, because most of us starting our exams are in mid to late 20s, early 30s, past that too. But that's the majority of us are like mid to late 20s when we're first starting the exams. So what's happening then? You've graduated. Now we've got to work. So most people are working full time. And it's also baby making time for a lot of people. So a lot of people start planning families or maybe have families. And so with these exams, we really have to make sure that we're um, balancing life work exams, but never feel like you can't do the exams because you have a full-time job or because you have kids, anything like that. So it's totally possible. You just have to get creative and you also have to make it a priority. So if the exams are not a priority for you, it will be really easy to not make the time for it. Because at the end of the day, when you've worked a full day in architecture, who wants to come home and read a textbook about architecture? Most people don't want to. And so you have to make it a, a big priority in your life in order to keep that consistency and find that time. So that's my, my introduction to how and when and the details. So um, Derek said right now, getting all the resources. Awesome. So perfect timing. So you're gathering your resources, figuring it out, figuring out what this whole crazy process looks like. Once you have your resources, now 
you should put together a plan. So the way I like to do it is I like to even look at the biggest picture, the big picture. So if I'm looking at the six exams, when do I want to finish by? And then kind of work backwards. And you want to be realistic. There are some people that pass all exams in a couple months, but the average time to pass these exams is 2.1 years. And so don't go in it thinking, okay, I'm going to pass all these exams in six months. And then you set yourself on such a tight timeline where you're not allowing yourself to breathe or have life, life or balance. You get burned out and then you end up procrastinating and putting them off. So instead, start with a more realistic schedule and then kind of work backwards. So say it's a year or 18 months. I think you can do a year. Start working backwards. I always incorporate in that schedule a couple fails because it happens. 55% is the pass rate. And so you figure in some fails. Some of the more difficult exams are, um, you know, PA, PPD, PDD. So those are ones that I would definitely just put in a fail. Just, it's not like you're manifesting it or anything. You're just creating a plan so that you don't get thrown off track if it happens. Also, the first exam. A lot of times people fail that first exam because they're just learning what that is like, what it's like to sit in the exam center or at home for the exam, what the, you know, what it's, what it feels like, what the actual exam is like compared to how you've studied compared to the practice exams. So failing that first exam is totally normal too. So just saying that when you're coming through your, your timeline. So Derek, right now I'm 27 goals to be licensed before 30, also finishing a master's in construction management. So trying to drug, juggle everything. Okay, so working full time and school and the exams, that is a lot. So make sure that you are being realistic about that. So you have three years, maybe a little less. That's fine. That's totally possible. I started my exams when I was 27 and a half, a little bit more than 27 and a half. And I passed my last exam when I was like two months before I turned uh, 30. So it was like right about two years for me. And I had a kid at the time. She was 10 months when I started, two years and 10 months when I ended. And I also was working. I was starting my firm. Um, I had already kind of started my firm, so I was working on projects. So um, definitely it's possible. And that was one of the questions that came in was, if you had children before you took the exams, did studying change your routine with the kids? So um, this can kind of go in with what you're talking about too, is is um, going to school, sorry, lost, lost track, uh, going to school and working full time. And also maybe now for some people, it's maybe it's not going to school, but maybe it's working full time and having kids. So what you want to do is create that big picture schedule, like I was mentioning, break it down, and then break it down even further. Go into realistic weeks. What do your weeks look like? And actually make a plan that you will be able to stick with and make sure you are incorporating things like hanging out with friends or a day off. You're not needing to study 40 hours a week. I believe the sweet spot is about six weeks. And including in that six weeks is the last week is chill. You're the last week you are taking care of yourself. You're going on walks, you're working out, you're eating well, you're sleeping. And so it's not like six weeks of hardcore studying. Now, again, if you have something like a um, you're working full time and you are also getting your master's, don't put that on yourself. Like, okay, each week I'm going to move the needle towards it a little further, but also make it a priority if that's what you're wanting to do, because there's no point in like studying a little bit and not having like an actual 
set scheduled date because then it's like you're kind of just not moving forward. You're not really moving forward. You're just kind of like, oh, I'll just study here and there. It's like you want to get serious. Make the decision when you're ready. I'm going to start studying. This is when I'm going to take my exam and then do it. But also make sure you're you're navigating your schedule like you're saying because you don't want to totally kill yourself. Now with the kids, and this can work for you too, um, is with the kids, like, did I change up my schedule with the kids? No, not really. Um, I kind of worked around their schedule. So you may have to work around school. You may have to work around um, work. And then I also time blocked. And so I got real creative. So for me with the kids, it was like, okay, she's going to go down to nap and I'm going to take a practice exam while she naps. My first child did not nap barely at all. She stopped napping at like two and she seriously would take like 15 minute naps. And so it wasn't easy, but I got real good at doing like 15, 10 minute designer hack quizzes while she napped real quick. So you just do a little bit as you can. If that's maybe listening to a, uh, ARE lecture or podcast or audio something while you commute, that's something. And um, again, at the end of the day, when you've worked hard, gone to school, or you have kids, studying's not going to be really the thing that you want to do. So create a plan for that. What are you going to do on weeknights? Maybe it's just review flashcards or just watch a couple YouTube videos on some content and then do your harder studying on the weekend. So that looks a little different for everyone. But so to go back, to circle back to the original question of if you were just starting today, when would you schedule that first exam? I would get your resources and then I would look at my schedule and if it's feasible to study 10, 15 hours a week, maybe even a little bit more for some weeks, then I would schedule it for six weeks from now. If because of your schedule, that's too tight, then maybe seven, but really you don't want to push it more than eight. Like it just starts to get to a point where you could take all the time in the world. You're never going to feel totally ready. So try that out. See how that works with your current schedule and see what you think. All right. Let me know if that was helpful. Okay. Um, I've seen the architect's HOP student version is less expensive. Do you mean um, the AHPP, the architect's handbook of professional practice, the student version, less expensive? Uh, do I recommend using it? If that, if you're talking about the architect's handbook of professional practice, I definitely recommend not using the student version. Get the, the regular studio version, not student version. It is the best resource you will use. And I think, oh, I'm using it actually to hold my, my phone up right now. <laughs> but I usually keep it right here. I use it in the studio. Like I use it even while I'm working. And that's the thing with these exams. It's like, if you start approaching it like you are using these resources and getting this information in order to be an awesome architect and maybe run your business one day, then you're going to want these resources. These are going to make you a better architect. So the student version, I don't recommend it, not for Architects Handbook of Professional Practice because it's such a key resource for these exams. So definitely get the, the regular one. And then there's actually another question about the AHPP. Um, Alexandra over here on YouTube said, have you found the AHPP Wiley charts beneficial when you studied? Yes. I loved the Wiley charts because like any chart, it's helpful just to navigate your studying a little bit more so you're not feeling like you have to read everything. With the AHPP, I definitely dove into more than just what was on the Wiley charts. But what I did was I used those to narrow down my focus, especially when it was getting close to the exams. So I would go in there and I would make sure that I really had gone through, um, like at a deeper level, those areas that were in the chart. 
and then, you know, from a broader perspective, like went further, but use those as kind of like a checklist, essentially. So that's a great question. And then that's why I also have um, the my resource guide. So if you don't have my ARE resource guide, you can check it out on YouTube. I'll have it in the comments on Instagram. It's in my bio. You can go download it for free. But it's it's kind of like a, um, a broader version of the Wiley chart. It's just like which resources to use for which exam. And then I do have the ultimate study plan. And that's kind of like the Wiley chart kind of for all the resources. So like each exam has a six week breakdown of what to study, when to study it, what chapters to study. So you're not feeling like you have to study every single resource. So all those resources, if you message me or leave a comment or anything, if you want me to send you anything, um, I have tons of ARE resources to help you out. Some paid, but are, some are free. So let me know, or you can go check it out on my website. Awesome. Derek, much appreciated. Let me know what you think, Derek, once you've looked at that calendar and you start kind of planning it out. Let me know how that feels with your study, um, your, your current study school and work schedule. And if you do want a six week plan that takes you through those six weeks, the ultimate study plan would be really helpful for you because it will bring you through each of those weeks. So you're not just like looking at a pile of books thinking, okay, what do I do next? <laughs> Cause that can be very overwhelming. All right. I have Speaking of, well, I'm going to actually answer this question real quick because it's an easy answer. Um, but someone reached out when I asked about what questions you have and was wondering about a foreign architecture license. So um, they got really specific, but I just want to like briefly just say NCARB is a great resource for any sort of question for foreign architects. So there, if you just Google NCARB foreign architecture path. They'll, they have like a full chart. They're definitely the ones to ask um, because they'll have, it, it's different for everybody. So go there. Um, I just wanted to address that on here before moving on. Okay. Is anyone either starting an architecture business or interested in starting an architecture business or in the future want to be in business? I'm curious. And while you guys answer, I'm going to take a sip of coffee. <laughs> like I was, I'm such a time person. I'm not a time person. I should say it was like 10 59 and I'm like, I need coffee. Oh no, I'm supposed to go on in like one minute. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I had a couple questions about business. And one of the questions that I got was if I had any financial book recommendations for architects. And I do have, I have like too many architecture books that I recommend for starting a business. I, I have so many books that I love. And so I have a link. I don't have it actually in my, I'll have to, um, when I get off here, I'll put it in my website, but I have a kit co, which is kit.co. And I have a section there that is for books every entrepreneurial designer needs. I need to update it because I haven't updated in a while. So there's some really, really good ones on there. But I'm just going to take you a couple of my recommendations for financial books for starting a business, um, for some other books for starting a business. And then, yeah, some that I'm currently reading. What's in my queue? I have so many books. And I know that it's going to, I'm like, I don't have this written down. So I'm just going to say them but then I'll leave a link. I'll make a little list and then I can um, leave a link for you. Okay. So, and I want to know if anyone has read any of these because there's some that are just, okay. Um, Beauty Rush started my own business a year ago, just started studying last week. Congratulations. That's incredible. I love it. Starting your business before you're finishing your exams. I did the same thing. And a lot of people feel like they can't do that but you totally can. So that's awesome. So I have some good book recommendations for you then. So this question was specifically about financial books. So a couple of financial ones that I really recommend 
architect and entrepreneur. This is Eric Reinhold, which is 30 by 40, which if you don't know Eric, beautiful, beautiful cinematography. Um, he has a YouTube account. He just does such beautiful work. And um, I found Eric back in the day in like 2012 or 2013 when he was writing articles on house about starting a business. And I literally was like, bookmarking and saving. I think I had even a Pinterest board of basically Eric's like articles on house. And then he started his YouTube. So I started following him there and then he had his book and like, just, I lo I've loved watching his progression and he's just really inspiring. So 30 by 40, Eric Reinhold, but he, his book Ar architect and entrepreneur is a great book starting out just breaking down what the process is like, um, business, even supplemental income type stuff. So that one is a great one. Definitely recommend. And then I have some other ones that aren't architecture focused, but are very helpful. So Profit First by Mike Melkowicz. Mal <laughs> is that how you pronounce it? Melkowicz. Um Profit first is great. And I will tell you when I, I have done a lot of like money mindset work, which if you are starting a business or in business, highly recommend, highly recommend making sure you have a really healthy relationship with money, um, which is like a whole other topic. But once I kind of transformed how I approached money, I found that I was able to increase my rates and get less pushback on my pro on my proposals which is amazing. And profit first is teaching you that it's not the same um running a business isn't like okay you have your expenses you have this you have this you have this and then you have the profit. It's you have profit first because if you don't have profit you don't have a thriving healthy business. And if you don't have a thriving, healthy business, you won't stay in business. So nothing else really matters at that point. And I did not know this and I did not approach my business this way for a long time. To me, it was like, oh, profit is like, you know, that's like uh, greedy or whatever, which is crazy. But I, once I read this book, I realized, wait a second, that makes sense. If I don't have profit, then I'm literally slaving paycheck to paycheck and barely able to make the expenses on this business. And it's not going to flourish. It won't allow me to hire because there's not extra profit to be able to afford to hire. So profit first is great. And then the other one, never split the difference by Chris Voss. This was another really great one just for understanding how to um, put together my proposals and to negotiate more with clients and also to feel really um, secure in the um, proposals that I was giving. So to feel good about what I was sending out where before it was kind of like, I didn't totally understand my own value. And so it was really easy to not, to undercharge basically. And so never split the difference and profit first, both really helped with understanding the value of what I was doing, um, creating the proposals, writing the proposals so that they created options for people. So it made sense, made it easier for people to sign and, um, and I landed more contracts. So, and higher contracts and started making way more money. So definitely recommend those. Oh, Hey Wes, how you doing? Um, Wes is saying, what are your thoughts on rich dad, poor dad? And if you haven't seen my episode with Wesley, we, I think it was April or was it March? Oh my gosh. I don't know. I can't keep track of time. I think April, um, definitely go check that out. My thoughts on rich dad, poor dad is that I need to reread it because I grew up in a house that was very much all about rich dad, poor dad, and finances and everything. But I was also grown, I was also raised in a house that was very frugal and um, like 
some of my family had money, some of my family had no money. And I grew up with this idea that in order to have any sort of money, you had to live like you were poor, not spend any money, drive a really rundown car, all this stuff. And I came into adulthood. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I also grew up with like the stories of it. And like, it was always talked about in my house. And then I read it, but young, when I was younger and then as an adult, I feel like I don't remember the story as it actually was. I remember it based on like, like little chunks and the chunks that I got, it didn't serve me well. Um, and so I would like to reread it because I have heard that and I, I know the premise of it and like, it makes so much sense. And like, there are such great teachings in it. Um, I think I just need to reevaluate it because I think I came into it when I read it with so many limiting beliefs about money that it didn't, it didn't serve me in a good way. So now that I have a healthy relationship with money, healthy mindset with it, I want to reread it so that it's, um, I can understand it from a different perspective, if that makes sense. What did you think about Rich Dad Poor Dad? I've I'm curious. Okay, couple other books. I mean, I could talk about books forever, but a couple other ones. This is Marketing by Seth Godin. I or Godin. Um, I love marketing. I didn't realize I loved marketing until I started my business and like love it. And I also realized how freaking powerful marketing is for starting and running a business. So when you start a business, most of us start off as solopreneurs and you need to be a marketer, right? We're marketing ourselves, we're marketing our projects, we're marketing the types of projects that we want, the types of clients that we want. And so a lot of what we do is marketing. And so we have to know how to market ourselves and our business to get our ideal clients. So um, this is marketing by Seth Godin's great um, predictably irrational is also really, really good. Um, this is kind of for marketing, but it's also for, um, proposals and, and putting together prices too. It just really talks about like how irrational people's decision making is but how it's actually pretty predictable. And so if we can predict how irrational they're going to be, like creating different price points and knowing that they're going to probably go with this price point if you do this um, and how it is kind of irrational, but we can predict that. And that also will really help you set up your proposals, which all these things is really awesome and helpful. Which by the way, if you don't have time to like sit down and read book, I get it. I'm an audible learner. So I like to listen. I use an app called Libby and Libby is connected to local um, libraries. And so you can actually get audiobooks and like Kindle books for free. So it's a great way to be able to consume all of these. Um, okay. The next one is The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks incredible book, especially if you're in business and maybe you've like hit a plateau or maybe you're at a certain threshold and you can't break above it. Maybe you've, um, you know, you're really wanting a certain revenue number, but like you're, you're not able to get to it. The big leap is huge and incredibly amazing. It's also great if you're taking the architecture exams because it's, talks about like self-sabotage and uh, possibly maybe why you've been failing over and over. So the big leap is really, really good. Or if you're procrastinating a lot, um, really just like getting in your own way, the big leap is awesome. Next one is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Now this one is just like an all-around life book. I highly recommend it just for anyone living. But if you're in business, it's also just really great because if you can be an effective person, if you can be a well-rounded person, if you can be someone who um, 
works well in life, then you are more likely to stay consistent, not give up. Business isn't easy um, and get more clients. So it's a great book. Okay. And then I was just going to say, I'm currently reading what I have on my desk. My side desk is Architect and Developer by James Petty. I have been wanting to read this forever. It's not even that big of a book, but um, I finally just got it a couple weeks ago. And so I've started to dive into that, which is exciting. And it's a little like I love business books and marketing books. And so this is a little bit different for me, um, but I want to do development. I'd love to um, be architect and developer. So I'm diving into that. And then there's a couple other ones that are like in my queue, but I don't want to dive too far into this because, you know, we could talk about books forever, but I'll make a list and I'll put it out there so you guys can get these. Um, okay, Wes, it was part of an Amway scheme that one of my old teammates tried to get me involved in. It was a good book, but having multiple people trying to recruit me into Amway ruined it for me. Oh, interesting. So it was like a MLM type recruitment thing. Yeah, that seems weird. So maybe you have the same feeling as me. It's like, maybe it's a good book, but for some reason, just not a good taste in your mouth. So <laughs> need to, need to reread it or whatnot. Yeah, you're welcome for the book recommendations. Again, I know it's like just spewing them out. So I'll write them down so you can see them. Um, for someone who doesn't want to go to architecture school, but would love to learn about architectural visualization, what path do you recommend? Books, tutorials, software, what to read and learn? That's a great question. Um, I think today's age, we are so lucky because YouTube University, right? I mean, you can learn just about anything on YouTube. Also masterclass. I love masterclass. When I, uh, a couple of years ago, I did um, Frank Geary's masterclass. And then also Kelly Wurstler has a great masterclass. So if you're just wanting to get like an idea of design, architecture, that sort of thing, definitely I would go into certain masterclasses or um, online like YouTube. And then also maybe even um, Sorry, I just got distracted. Yes, this live will be saved. I'll save it here. And then it's also going to be on YouTube because I'm kind of dual streaming here. <laughs> um, yeah, I would recommend just starting out like that. You can, of course, uh, there's intro design books and whatnot, but I would really start online. And then there's also um, there's also a lot of like courses that you can buy online. And so what's nice about that, it's not like you're having to go to architecture school, but you can see what path of architecture interests you and where you want to go and then go there. So if it's really the visualization side of architecture, maybe what does that mean? Does it mean sketches? Does it mean 3D models? Does it mean renderings? And then you can kind of dive into that area. So I hope that answers there. Awesome. Okay. I have, let's see how many, I think, was that my last question? I think. Um, well, I did have another question. I was going to say, we're getting almost to the hour, which is crazy. How did that go by so fast? Um, yeah, you're welcome. I hope that helps answer it. Um, cause I get it not wanting to like do a whole school. It's a, it's a process. Um, but if anyone is on here and has any additional questions you want to dive into. I was going to say that um, I did have a question more on fees and architecture, but I seriously think that that could be like a, a full hour or at least a full episode. So I, I'm going to put that on my, my schedule to make an episode about architecture fees, starting, how do you figure out your fees? What are, what's the whole deal with fees. So I will make sure to um, put that on my list and have an episode come out soon for that. So, all right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, oops, just moved my camera. Then I think it's been almost an hour. 
Oh, got another question. Um, I'm like, I could stay on here, but <laughs> uh, I appreciate everyone who's hanging out with me today. It's great. I do have to say, like, I went live last week and I'm like, this is nice to be able to like talk with you and get because so often I'm just doing this by myself. And so I don't know, maybe I'll do that like maybe once a month or something, maybe like the first Tuesday of the month, I'll go live instead of a recorded episode. Don't hold me to it. You've heard it first, but, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, okay. Um, yes, Arnold, I'm going to upload this live right afterwards. Um, it'll be on YouTube and then it'll also be, I'll just put it on my feed on Instagram too. But if you, you can always go find it on YouTube too. Um, Derek, what was more challenging architecture school or the exam process? ARES. That's a really good question because bo both of them were very challenging. Architecture school took longer. Um, but I would say the exams were more difficult because to me more, well, I was going to say more was kind of like writing on the exams, but I guess not because a lot's writing on school, right? I couldn't take the exams if I hadn't gone through school. Um, but school is, I don't know, like when you're doing your exams, there's a lot of internal stuff you're having to work on. You're having to, you're doing it by yourself. You're having to figure it out all by yourself. You're having to, you know, gather all the resources. And also at that point, you kind of like feel like you are done because you've already done school. You've already graduated. So when I was going through my exams, I had a daughter. I was working. Um, I was doing all that. And at the same time, I wasn't able to call myself an architect. I was having to always explain, yeah, I graduated, but I I'm not an architect yet. And then at the same time, while doing all that, I was having to study and take these exams and then failing these exams when you've done so much work to get there and then you're not actually passing. And then now you're having to like, it just is a kind of a mind. I don't know what else is a call it except, except for saying the bad word. <laughs> it's difficult. It is um, it's a tough time because you're having to do it with everything else. Um, when I was in school, I was working still, but I was working part-time and school just took precedence, obviously. And when we're taking our exams, it's not really the case. It's not like we're doing our exams full-time and work and everything else takes the back seat. It's no, you have to fit in these exams within the rest of your life and within everything else. And that can be really tough. So I think all in all, the exam process was more difficult for me. I also didn't fail classes in architecture school. I was not a straight A student, but that's because I didn't try to be a straight A student. I, I, that wasn't important to me. Uh, it was more important to me to do well in studio um, because I was passionate about it and get passing grades in the other ones and have a life and work. And um, I didn't have as much, I didn't have as much expectation and pressure on architecture school. So I had a lot of expectation and a lot of pressure on the exams that I put on myself and that I put on the exams. Um, and I knew that they were the last thing I needed to do. I knew that that's what was standing in my way of being able to call myself an architect. So yeah, that was, I think the exams were more difficult. So um, let's see. Oops. Fees would be a great episode. Struggle with it every time. I got you. And I know like, cause you just started your business last year, like a fees will always be something that you're having to kind of like navigate, test out, send out proposals. How is it being, you know, it, it, the thing with, uh, and I don't want to dive too, but, but like, am I conveying the amount of value in this so that my fee becomes a no brainer 
or am I not conveying the value properly? And so the fee is being either not accepted, right? But then also in architecture for so long, there's like not a lot of um, transparency with with fees. So it's like, am I charging as much as this high-end architecture firm that's been around for 50 years? Or am I like not charging enough? Or do I have the same value as that architecture firm that's been around for 50 years? Or, you know, like how do I perceive um, my fees and what is that fee going to have? How are my clients going to perceive me or my firm based on those fees? Like there's so much to go in with it. Um, and so what changed it for me was reading those, standing my value. seem like an arbitrary number where I didn't really even know how to justify it to myself. And so I didn't justify it to my client. And once I ran the numbers, know your numbers. So once you run the numbers, you're able to justify the numbers. You're also able to see the value in what you do. And each time it'll get a little bit easier. And you'll also, you'll, I'm constantly morphing my fees too, you know, you may try to raise your fees to a level that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. And then, you know, maybe you'll have to backtrack a little bit. I'll say I've never backtracked after moving my fees up to somewhere where I feel uncomfortable. Um, I just try to do that every so often, maybe every six months or so is I try to bring them up to a space that makes me feel uncomfortable and it creates a new baseline. So I have lots of tips and, and, and things about that too. So we'll definitely, I'll definitely go into that. Um, if, if nobody has question, is there any intro to architecture books you recommend? I love modeling and visualization in Unreal. Um, that's a good question. Anyone here have any good intro to architecture books? Because I think like the ones I'm thinking of are more like what we would get in school, which is a little bit more about how to think like a designer and how to, um, the introduction to architecture is how to start thinking like an architect. And so they're a little less like modeling and visualization techniques, but, um, yeah, if anyone has any great modeling or visualization books, then please leave a comment or let us know because I don't really have any good recommendations, unfortunately. I feel like Instagram, social media is a great place for um, seeing modeling, seeing visualization, and then maybe like diving deeper into that. But I think, um, oh no, it's sketches. So no, I leave a comment on here for you. So, okay. Well, we've gone over an hour. I, I don't want to make this too long. People will uh, never want to rewatch it, <laughs> but we'll, I have a couple now. Okay. I have a to-do list for me is get you guys that list of books so that you can have them all in one spot. And then also um, come out with an episode all about fees. And if you have specific questions about fees, um, shoot me a DM or leave a comment on this so that I probably easier to leave a comment on this afterwards. And then that way I can um, go through those and answer them during the episode. Or maybe that can be next month's live coming up. Hey everyone. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. So fun. I will see you next time. Au revoir. I have to figure out how to end both these. <laughs> Let's see.